<sighs> Hello. I'm tired, you guys. Those Asimov videos took way longer than I thought they were gonna take. So I thought to myself, you know, I'll take it easy for once. I'll make a nice, uh, uh, short and sweet little Star Wars video and uh, look where we are. Don't, don't look at the time code. Don't worry, it's still a video essay that I meticulously scripted because I don't know how to do anything else. I'm Sage, by the way, I make the videos, but I don't usually appear in them. Do I look good? Is that what all the comments are gonna be about? I guess it doesn't matter if I look good. What matters is that I'm cozy during the filming of the video. A while back, my internet friend and host of Beyond the Screenplay, Trisha Arand, made this fun little timeline of Star Wars media in order of release, terming the current era as the franchise era, exhaustive period. Because the glut of Star Wars media over the last few years has truly felt exhausting. But also, it's felt exhausting in exactly the same ways which is what makes it an era that we can put a box around and notice what makes it different from what came before and also from what's happening now. Because with the release of Andor, the exhaustive period is over. I really think when we look back and try to define this era of Star Wars, Andor is going to be an inflection point. There will be a pre-Andor, which we can call the Andor era because he was a part of it. And there will be a post-Andor, which we can call the Andor era because He's the best part of it. And it's up to me to contemporaneously and preemptively define what both represent because I've deemed myself in charge of this. You can just do that on the internet. It's an endless game of dibs. So what qualities define each period and which is better? And or, and or, and or. There's three trends that Star Wars was settling into that I wanna talk about. Trends that Andor is a departure from. These are, how it uses fan service, the kind of filmmaking craft on display, and the extent to which they engage with political themes. What happens when a story becomes so self-referential that it ceases to have a self to reference? What happens when an Ouroboros finishes eating itself? The pre-Andor Disney era of Star Wars was, in my opinion, disappearing into its own love of a particular splice of Star Wars. So I watched the Obi-Wan show this summer out of some morbid curiosity because I really didn't enjoy my time with the Boba Fett show. Obi-Wan is at least a much more coherently structured story, but it also suffers from the same fixation on fan surface, a myopic focus on the same three or four characters whose relationships cannot fundamentally change because of the weight of the canon surrounding them. The few relationships that are allowed to be dynamic are retreads of relationships we've seen before. An old guy has to take care of a kid, a bad guy has a redemption arc. The ground is so well trod, it's a highway. So fan service is great marketing, but it is also constricting. Let's take a look at the second season of The Mandalorian. It's a fun little adventure with a really phenomenal ending before they undid it in the next show. But looking back on it, it seems entirely designed as a way to link together as many cameos as possible. The characters run into Bo-Katan, which leads them to Ahsoka, who talks about Thrawn, and then they run into Boba Fett, and the whole thing ends with Luke Skywalker saving the day. Nearly every single episode has the feel of being designed backwards from the intent of incorporating all of these cameos. It gets stale. To the point that Pedro Pascal actually did need to clarify that yes, season three would include new faces. <laughs> What other franchise would ever need to clarify that? Like I promise there will indeed be flickering moments of time in the next season that don't feel like completely cynical retreads of previous stories. The Mandalorian himself then entered the pantheon of cameos by basically hijacking the last two episodes of the Boba Fett show. By that point, the story structure of that show was already irrevocably broken with overlong flashbacks that were more interesting than the main story but sapped any forward momentum that the main story could have built. So it's a welcome reprieve to have Mando show up, but that's not to the show's credit that it was so uninteresting and shallow that it needed to be rescued by a different popular helmeted guy. By the end of the show, all that's left is watching a sequel's character fight a prequelish robot while an original's character rides an original's monster and then fights an animated show character. The metaphor of a child smashing his toys together is overused in criticism, but how else do you even describe this? But you know, at least those are characters. The worst is when Star Wars and its fans fetishize props. I feel like I'm living in a bizarre world when I see people talking about nostalgic callbacks and references to props and sets in these shows. Like, look at this article, which is about how in an episode of the Boba Fett show, the Mandalorian holds up a pipe and you see uh, that's the same kind of pipe that Han uses in the garbage compactor scene. And if references to other Star Wars media wasn't enough, Obi-Wan takes the self-referentiality of the franchise to a new meta level in its finale right here. 
Hello there. Now, if you're a normal person, you just heard a guy say a totally innocuous phrase. But if you're terminally online, is that still gonna be a phrase if Twitter dies? Are you following me on Twitter? But if you're terminally online, then you know it's not just a greeting. See, back in 1976, Obi-Wan said, Hello there. And then I guess as a reference to that, in 2005, Obi-Wan said, Hello there. And for a few years, nobody cared. But then the internet decided that literally every frame and pixel of the prequel trilogy was worthy of its own meme. So in Obi-Wan, when a scene dramatically ends with him saying, Hello there. It's not just a reference to this and this, but to all of this, which is what makes this what TV Tropes calls an ascended meme, for when the creators of a work recognize and incorporate memes of that work in future installments. But it's a bad name because memes should not ascend. Memes should stay down in the mud where they belong. The better term, coined by my friend Patrick H. Willems, is juggernauting, named after this moment in X-Men 3. I'm the juggernaut, bitch! What's most annoying about this moment to me isn't its existence, but its placement. It's the last line of a scene in the last episode that is supposed to bring emotional closure to the story. Obi-Wan finally gets to talk to Luke. I should be feeling things here, but I can't because they're too eager to wink and nod at me to sell the moment on its own merit. So I mean, by the time Obi-Wan ended, I was really asking myself, what are, what are we doing here? Like really, is this the fate of Star Wars, an endless recursive loop of the same symbols repeated forever and ever into infinity? But then Andor happened. We didn't do anything that was fan service. The mandate in the very beginning was that it would be as absolutely non-cynical as it could possibly be. That the show would just be real and honest. That's from the showrunner of Andor, Tony Gilroy, and boy did they deliver on this. Andor is absolutely in the spirit of Star Wars without just reproducing what Star Wars was once again. We go to Coruscant, but it's different. Fascism has stripped the beauty of the planet and made it a drab nightmare of endless stone corridors and eerily pristine boardrooms. Ferrex evokes the griminess of Tatooine, but is colder and distinct. One of the few times it has a reference to other Star Wars is when the fashy boot-licking cop, I'm gonna say fascism a lot in this video, so like, take a drink or whatever, loses his job and is reduced to living with his mother where he drinks blue milk. It's a punishment. <laughs> Drinking blue milk is a punishment for this character. The show is so bereft of this kind of fan service that the entire media ecosystem built up around pointing at Easter eggs and saying, did you catch that? Was so absolutely starving for sweet, sweet hashtag content that they were reduced to this. Did you catch this Star Wars Easter egg in the latest episode of Andor? We can see clearly that the ISP is recording this conversation, and we know this because of these space surveillance cameras. Han, Luke, and Chewie blasted a bunch of identical looking cameras when they stormed the detention block of the original Death Star in A New Hope. This is a silly thing to harp on, but you're not supposed to catch this as a reference. The point of them here is so your brain instantly grocks that you're looking at an Imperial location so that you can then pay attention to the scene at hand. You're forgetting to do the important part. Or maybe you're not, I don't know you. I also think the fact that Ander doesn't have to spend time on Easter eggs or fan service allows the writers to get really creative with world building. It doesn't rely on previous media, so it has to create environments that are unique and interesting themselves. I love the introduction to Ferex where we see this place where the workers all hang their work gloves on the wall outside the building, which immediately tells us this is a community. They can hang their stuff up outside because they know no one is going to steal them. That's a setup for the big moment later where the community engages in a collective act of civil disobedience to provide cover for those escaping the authorities. They just put all these clever little twists on things that we're familiar with. So instead of a, it just being a clock tower, there's a guy who's having the best time of his life, like playing the bell drums. In this scene, a character is tortured, but instead of being tortured in the way we've seen people be tortured in Star Wars before, they invent a completely unique and interesting way of doing a scene like that, which will make a chill run down your spine. There's a three episode prison arc on this show, and if the only locations that existed in Star Wars were the ones we see in the movies and shows, then this would be a universe that is like 30% prisons. It's like a space America. But instead of just being a prison, or instead of sending him to a prison we've seen before, they decide to invent the most sinister and unsettling place imaginable. So in this prison, the prisoners aren't allowed to wear shoes, and the way they are controlled is through electroshocks from the floor. 
the guards all have these boots that negate the shock, and this means that it's a prison without bars, but one where you are more policed under penalty of violence than any other. It's a brilliant obstacle for the characters to overcome that I haven't seen done before. There's a quote that is stuck in my mind forever from J.J. Abrams about his approach to The Force Awakens, where he says, I try to focus on things that I find inspiring about cinema. I ask questions like, how do we make this movie delightful? That was really the only requirement Larry and I imposed on each other. The movie needed to be delightful. The Force Awakens is delightful in a lot of ways, but one of the main ways is because it is indulgent with its nostalgia. But in the seven years since that movie, in a media landscape that aches to be as pleasantly nostalgic as The Force Awakens was, what I've realized is that delightful is kind of torturous. But torturous, delightful. How do you know about me? I was hoping for a more relaxed conversation, but you're right, we don't have time. I think what Andor does best is tension. Tension requires the audience to have a clear understanding of the dangers that are present in the story. Think about how many Star Wars scenes you've watched where the characters are running down a hallway or something, a couple of stormtroopers appear, they blast them. This is action, but there's not that much tension. They blast them. It's like the action equivalent of a jump scare. Has its uses, but it's easy. They blast them. To paraphrase Alfred Hitchcock, if you have a bomb go off in a scene, sure, that'll surprise the audience for a second, but that's it. But if instead you tell the audience there is a bomb in the scene, then they're going to anticipate it going off and that's gonna create tension for as long as you want. Episode three of Andor is a masterclass in this. In this episode, there are exactly 14 goons. No more, no less. We see all of them early on. There are two officers and the rest are subordinates. When they reach Ferrix, Two of them stay with Andor's surrogate mother. The rest break into three teams of four and try to converge on the warehouse where they know Andor is. A huge chunk of this episode is just a conversation between two characters, but because we know the corpos are on their way, the tension escalates with each passing moment. It's a simple technique, but it's done so well here. We also have a clear understanding of who is with who and where everyone is. One team arrests Bix, Andor's friend, so they stop moving towards the warehouse. The team with the officers gets delayed, which means we know that in the firefight, Andor is up against four guys from the third team. Because we know all this, we can literally count the kills during this fight and know whether or not they're in danger. One dies in the first explosion, then one gets killed by the chains, which is an excellent element of this fight, by the way. Just adds a dynamic to the action that makes it more interesting than a simple shootout. And finally, Luthen shoots a third guy. For a second, we think that maybe they're safe, but then, wait, no, there was four guys, right? So maybe two of them died in the explosion and we only saw one? No, don't go for it, Andor! Bam, fourth guy starts shooting. The tension is kept throughout the scene. You can apply this to the other arcs in the show as well, the Aldani heist and the prison escape. They both establish how many bad guys there are. That's why they only keep a 40-man regiment in the garrison. How many guards on each level? Never more than 12 then put the characters in tense scenes anticipating the danger, and only then does the blasting start. Across the board, the craft on display in this show goes really above and beyond, which is notable because the Star Wars TV shows were starting to look a little cheap. Sure, The Mandalorian came out of nowhere and basically invented an entirely new way to do CGI by using this new technology called the volume. Rather than using a green screen, they surround the actor with LED screens that project a pre-made digital environment, which is a wonderful piece of technology that is sort of an update on one of the oldest kinds of special effects. It never stops being funny to me though that they invented all of this because The Mandalorian wears this big shiny helmet, which was reflecting the green from the green screens. So they needed to create the actual environment so that the colors were reflecting, right? Uh, and now this technology is being used on every major production to good and ill effect. Well, every major production, except for friggin' Andor, which built these immaculate real sets which feel extremely grimy and lived in. So The Mandalorian looks pretty good, but Boba Fett and Obi-Wan were inconsistent. Don't get me wrong, both of them look pretty good for television, but every once in a while there's an issue. Like, shots where the compositing looks fake. CG characters are never completely convincing either. A problem Andor avoids rather than solves because it has almost no alien characters. Really just those two dogs on Ferrix. A bigger issue for me is the choreography of the action scenes. Like this one with Boba that is very clunky. Or this speeder bike chase that feels like it's going on forever and that they're all only moving at 10 miles an hour. 
Worst offender is the forest chase with Leia, where these mercenaries keep failing to catch her because they keep incompetently running into trees and falling down. Like, how are you this bad at this? Just just, just catch her. She, she's nine years old. Generally, I was also just a little disappointed by the depiction of Jabba's palace and the other locations where the crime bosses hang out in the Boba Fett show. Jabba's palace in Return of the Jedi was smoke-filled, had tons of weird alien extras and harsh, moody lighting. So to see it rendered with flat TV lighting is kind of a shame. Sets on Obi-Wan sometimes felt small scale too. Like this gate crossing scene where Obi-Wan spends all his time frantically shooting this gate open even though there's plenty of room to walk around. The big dumb fun reason to watch the show was to see Anakin and Obi-Wan fight again, right? A shame both of their fights are so underlit it's basically impossible to see what's happening. It's criminal to film this at night. Both scenes get the honorary Long Night Award for worst lighting of the year. And look, a lot of people put a lot of work into these shows to make them look as good as they do. And far be it from me to critique the work of thousands of hardworking individuals. But please, can one of you just walk across the lot and ask the crew of Andor what they're doing different? Because Andor has been absolutely impeccable. It's not just the reliance on practical effects either. The CG has been just as impressive. Everything just clicks on this show. And you know, I could forgive all of these shows for these kinds of problems if I felt they had the writing to back it up, but at the end of the day, they're not really about much. So let's talk about the boogeyman of the Star Wars fandom, politics. During the release of Obi-Wan, the Star Wars franchise made a few headlines by actively pushing back against the toxicity within its own fandom. After the premiere episode, actress Moses Ingram posted a series of Instagram stories sharing some of the racist abuse she received for starring on the show something that was not a new experience for a person of color appearing in this series. What was new was that Star Wars made an official statement pushing back against it. On May 31st, they tweeted, We are proud to welcome Moses Ingram to the Star Wars family and excited for Reva's story to unfold. If anyone intends to make her feel in any way unwelcome, we have only one thing to say. We resist. There are more than 20 million sentient species in the Star Wars galaxy. Don't choose to be racist. Around the same time, Star Wars also advertised the cover for a newly released comic book, Bounty Hunters number 24. The cover featured two lesbian characters and a modified version of the Star Wars logo, which included the pride flag. Predictably, someone wrote, don't make Star Wars political. A little less predictably though, Star Wars made a solid reply. One, queer characters existing isn't political. Two, Star Wars is literally our name. Looking at these two moments in isolation, we can applaud Star Wars for doing something about the rampant racism and homophobia in their audience, like yes, even though this is a calculated business decision and not evidence that the Disney Corporation possesses a conscience, it's still good that they think that this is the way to handle this. But at the same time, it'd be nice, you know, if the movies and TV shows they were making actually backed this up. Because in the pre and or Disney era, there was a noticeable and exhausting trend of sidestepping any kind of politics at all. With exactly one exception we can't talk about for reasons. Force Awakens thrust viewers into a three-way political conflict where we barely understand two of the factions, though the one we do understand does at least have something to say about the resurgence of Nazism through the radicalization of the youth that was prescient at the dawn of the alt-right when this movie came out in 2015. I challenge anyone though to find a coherent political theme or even idea in Rise of Skywalker. I'll mail you a plaque that reads congrats on wasting your finite existence. That movie also spends a third of its runtime ensuring the Chinese censors that all of its lead characters are indeed straight, so pretty funny for them to say this weird and hypocritical times we live in. The Han Solo movie is a pretty fun romp, but it also has a droid character whose desire for liberation is mocked as annoying. She's a woke robot activist. Ha ha ha. It's lazy. Bad. I'm not a huge fan of Rogue One, but at least it can hang its hat on themes of self-sacrifice for a cause and inspiring hope. Then came the TV shows, which have mostly been ciphers. The political state of the galaxy is a distant backdrop in these shows, and making any kind of statement beyond fascism bad is pretty much unthinkable. Like, the Mandalorian takes place during a time when democracy is rebuilding itself, but the New Republic is only a minor presence in the story. The one interesting moment Obi-Wan had in this respect is when he and Leia get picked up by a truck driver and it turns out he's a MAGA Republican. A um, Magalian. The scene is a fun little observation on the mundanity of evil, but it's pretty isolated from the rest of the show. There's a definite sense in the Disney era thus far that they want to cut the sharp edges off of the Star Wars franchise. They want it to be easily marketable and inoffensive. That's the priority and political themes will always alienate some portion of the audience. They occasionally let one of their projects go this route, but it's measured so that it doesn't overtake the image of the brand. And this is all pretty strange given that this is, you know, 
Star Wars. Like, this all comes from movies that came out just a few years after the Vietnam War ended and had the audacity and balls to make the colonial imperial genocidal power that conquers the world with the use of stormtroopers be manned entirely by people with British accents while the rebels use guerrilla tactics and fight in the jungle. George Lucas, the original Chad, has flat out said the Ewoks are the Viet Cong. You did something very interesting with Star Wars, if you think about it. The good guys are the rebels. They're using asymmetric warfare against a highly organized empire. I think we call those guys terrorists today. We call them Mujahideen, we call them Al-Qaeda. When I did it, they were Viet Cong. Exactly. So were you thinking of that at the time? Yes. His prequel trilogy, which I can't believe I have to come out on here, the internet, and talk about positively, were about how democracies are infiltrated by demagogues, how the anxieties of young men who are confused about their place in the world can be manipulated by lying, powerful, hungry ghouls who want to use them to tear down institutions, and ended it with the hero turning into a villain by quoting one of the most famous lines from one of the most famous speeches of the sitting president of the United States at the time shortly after 9-11. If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. But when I say a story is political, I definitely mean it in a different way than the bozos that whine about their favorite franchises having gay people in them. What I mean by it is a story that has something to say about the moment we're in, and that says it with every tool of storytelling at its disposal. But even stories that don't have that much to say about social systems are not completely bereft of some kind of political message. Like look at The Mandalorian. 95% of that show is Mando hugging Grogu. I'd say that fatherhood is its central theme, but that's not not political. Fatherhood is necessarily a statement about gender roles. It just doesn't feel quote unquote political to most audiences because it more or less abides by the dominant ideology. Okay, listen, I know Baby Yoda is cute, but you, ha you have to pay attention to what I'm saying. You can't get you can't get distracted by what's really at issue for me isn't the presence of something political, but whether what's being looked at is actually controversial and interesting, whether it has the courage to explore topics where there is pushback. That's what I feel these other shows are hesitant to do, but which Andor embraces fully. Yeah, yeah, I know Clone Wars exists too. I did watch all of it recently though, and I am going to make a video about it that will be exclusive on Patreon. So if you want to hear all my extremely pedantic thoughts about that, you can pledge at the $5 tier. There are some other things going on on the Patreon too. You can watch the final cut of my big one hour foundation video, which is the true conclusion to my iRobot video. Personally, I think it's my best work. And I also recently made a little ramble about the Batman. I had some thoughts about the editing. That's going to stay a Patreon exclusive though, and I am going to be making more regular exclusive content like that for Patreon, so the only way to get all of my delicious little thoughts about the world is to go and support me on patreon.com slash justright. But seriously though, this video is about to get into some topics that will probably get this video demonetized, so if you're a fan of my general ability to survive on the internet, or survive in general, now would be a good time to join. Okay, so fascism. Andor is the most overtly political piece of Star Wars media ever. The commentary bleeds into just about every aspect of the show, literally from the first sequence where our Latino protagonist is hassled by some rent-a-cops over his papers. Broadly speaking, the show is anti-imperialism and anti-fascism, but the backdrop of each of its arcs interrogates one of the pillars of how those systems operate. Capitalism, colonialism, and the prison labor system. In the first arc, Andor is getting hunted down by the corporate police, but which see themselves as an arm of imperial authority. Corporate tactical forces are the Empire's first line of defense. This is such an interesting decision because we're used to the goons in a Star Wars story being stormtroopers, soldiers for an obviously evil empire that explicitly resembles the Nazis. This means the audience has no problem with seeing them killed in droves by the good guys. We're not meant to see Luke Skywalker as committing an immoral act when he blows up the Death Star and murders a gajillion space Nazis, because they're space Nazis. So in making Andor's opponent in this arc police officers, the morality of the violence is made grayer to a degree. It transfers our antipathy towards the Empire onto representatives 
of capitalism, equating them as, at least in this case, being in service of the same injustice. That is a bold political statement to be making when the defund the police movement is very present. Fascism has no coherent or consistent economic principles. It aligns itself with whatever forces it needs to to retain power, and thus it has a long and convoluted history with capitalism. But what I think is being touched on here is the tendency of capitalists to support fascist regimes. In Italy in 1922, it was the strength of trade unions and socialist agitation which terrified the upper and middle classes. They feared a revolution would disrupt their position in the social hierarchy, which is what led to the king empowering the fascist movement and putting Mussolini into power. Fascist governments also tend to privatize state-owned enterprises in order to entice the support of the wealthy. Mussolini, for instance, privatized life insurance, among a lot of other stuff. Star Wars touches on some of this across the animated series and in the prequels, as Emperor Palpatine brings various corporations under his control, like the banking clan. But just because corporations might support a fascist regime, the irony is that that does not guarantee their safety or autonomy within it, as they can be nationalized whenever it suits the government. In Andor, the pre Morlana corporate authority has autonomy from the Empire, but as soon as they screw up, the Empire comes in and puts them under direct Imperial control. You've rung the final bell on corporate independence. As of this morning, the Milana system is under permanent Imperial authority. This arc also includes flashbacks to Andor's childhood on a planet called Canari, which was the location of Republic corporate mining operations and where an industrial disaster during the Imperial era led to it becoming a toxic planet and abandoned. The politics of this arc has undertones of anti-capitalism that are so strong, they're just, you know, tones. The second arc is set on a planet suffering under imperial colonization. We learn that there used to be thousands of settlements, but that then the Empire came along and forcefully relocated everyone into cities where the people could be put to work for the Empire. 40,000 Aldanis all across the highlands. They were here for centuries. But it only took the Empire a decade to clear them out. Kill them? No. Drove them south. There's an enterprise zone in the lowlands. We're shown repeatedly that the Empire has no respect for the cultures it suppresses. The Aldani have a sacred temple on the river here that the Imperial troopers use as target practice. Target practice? That temple was on a river that the Aldani considered sacred, but which the Empire dammed up so that they could use the caves for storage. The leader of the garrison, a guy perfectly named Jayhold, if they ever make a conlang for Aldani, I hope the word for douchebag is Jayhold. Mr. Jayhold constantly expresses his racist disdain for the local population, deeming them lesser people who are simple minded and who smell bad. The Danis, they're simple people. They breed a sad combination of traits that make them particularly vulnerable to manipulation. We trade goat hides for a three-year lease, so they didn't smell so badly. It might be amusing. Come along, you two. The Darnies have a rough appetite for fragrance. Yes, I've been warned. And he's not the only one. How many do you think we'll have tomorrow? I don't know. It's less than a hundred last time. Still enough to smell him, right? The tactics Mr. Jayhold here uses to control the Dani population rely more on soft power than they do outright force. For instance, he wants the smallest number of them to come to the ceremony where they observe this astronomical phenomenon known as the Eye, a ceremony that holds cultural and religious value to them. We offer them a transport because we know they'll refuse, but then along the way we've placed a series of comfort units. Shelters and taverns with cheap local beverages. Quite predictably, what began as 500 pilgrims at the bottom has already dwindled down to... Where are we now, Lieutenant? We counted 60 last night, sir. It's a plot point that is deliberately evocative of the long history of European colonizers using alcohol to their advantage when negotiating and trading with Native Americans. Between this, the use of relocation, and the destruction and degradation of significant religious locations, what this arc of the show depicts is the definition of cultural genocide. We never see an act of explicit on-screen violence committed by the Empire against the Aldani, but the threat of violence and the policies they imposed are meant to destroy Aldani culture so that the remnants of their society are malleable to the project of imperialism. This is part of what makes the ending of this arc 
so cathartic. The heroes use the ceremony around the eye as their means of sneaking into the garrison, and then they use the meteor shower itself to cover their escape, effectively using something of cultural importance to the Aldani as the means by which they achieve victory over the Empire, and symbolically, liberation. This sequence is glorious. And that is, I believe, the intended message of the sequence, because in the very next episode, this scene happens. The use of any local custom, festival, or tradition as cover for rebel activity will trigger permanent revocation of imperial tolerance. This show was made by the Disney Corporation, a show about the tactics of cultural genocide. The Disney Corporation. And you're watching Disney Channel. What I find brilliant about this show is that it manages to do what few other prequels are capable of doing. It takes a story where we as the audience already know how things will end. We know that Andor will become a rebel and that he will die to help destroy the Death Star, which will eventually lead to the fall of the Galactic Empire. Which means that in this show, the opponent is an entity that cannot be defeated. Which means the stakes of the story can never be, will Andor defeat the Empire? because we already know what the answer is there. Instead, the story has to completely invest in the more subtle ideas of how does a person become a rebel and what is the cost of fighting a rebellion. I think those two questions are at the heart of the show, and unlike every other piece of Star Wars media, it takes a lot of time and struggle to answer those questions. Like usually in a Star Wars story, the becoming a rebel part is Pretty straightforward. Oh, your aunt and uncle got burninated in the barn? Well, sucks to be you, kiddo. Here's a blaster. They blast him. Even with characters like Han and Finn, who take a little more to come around to the cause, it's usually a pretty simple reason. My friends are rebels, and I like my friends. With Andor, his entire story in this first season has to be about his gradual radicalization to the side of the rebellion, a path that is not straight or simple, which is what makes it feel much more real, grounded, effective, visceral, and other good words. In its first three episode arc, Andor is on the edge of poverty at all times and lives just outside the law. He has anti-imperial sentiment. They're so fat and satisfied, they can't imagine it. Can't imagine what? Not someone like me would ever get inside their house. But his outlets to channel that rage are limited. He works as a thief and takes advantage of the hubris of the Empire so that he can get by financially, but being anti-Empire does not necessarily make someone pro-revolution. Luthen can train him to use guerrilla tactics. Never carry anything you don't control. But that doesn't mean Andor believes in the fight. His lack of commitment is what comes under the microscope in the second arc of the series. I think it's all useless. Better to spit on their food and steal their trinkets. It's better to leave. Better to eat, sleep, do what you want. You don't know me. Here, he joins a small band of rebels who are planning a heist that will help fund the rebellion. The minute Andor arrives, he comes under suspicion from most of the rebels who do not trust him. And they kinda shouldn't trust him. These episodes contrast him with two other characters, Nemec and Skeen. Nemec, who of course fills the obligatory rebel role of little dude with weird hat and some ideas about stuff, is selfless and a true believer in the cause. Nemec's a surprise. He's green, but he's all in. He's a true believer. Meanwhile, Skeen is just out for himself and doesn't care about the revolution. It's an our rebellion for you. Bro, I'm a rebel. It's just, uh... Me against everybody else? During this arc, Andor is smack dab in the middle of them. Andor between them. My man Nemec has a manifesto, you see, and takes every opportunity to educate the rebels around him. They can all see the injustices of the Empire, but it's Nemec who's documenting it and analyzing their tactics. We've grown reliant on Imperial tech and we've made ourselves vulnerable. There's a growing list of things we've known and forgotten, things they've pushed us to forget. Things like freedom. I mean, it's so confusing, isn't it? So much going wrong, so much to say, and all of it happening so quickly. The pace of repression outstrips our ability to understand it, and that is the real trick of the Imperial Thought Machine. It's easier to hide behind 40 atrocities than a single incident. This scene is so cool. There's a moment here where Nemec equates his manifesto with the navigational tool he and Andor are talking about earlier. Fresh inspiration, two seemingly random objects, and yet 
This charts an astral path, this maps the trail of political consciousness, both systems based on truth, both navigating toward clear and achievable outcomes. In other words, you can't just win a rebellion with physical tools, tools like the ones that Andor used to steal and or sell. You need some way to interpret the miasma of events caused in the wake of a fascist regime coming to power, a means to understand how they take power and keep it. Because that understanding is truly what would keep the rebels committed to their cause and capable of changing the system. But. Andor isn't ready to listen. As in the first arc, Andor only knows he doesn't like the Empire. Great. Uh, I'd like to hear what Clem believes. I know what I'm against. But it's an untempered feeling. He's not truly committed. There's a great way this is visually communicated. So the scene starts with Namek walking into camp with milk, and the camera intentionally begins the scene with it in the center of frame, subtly telling us to pay attention to the milk. Pay attention to the milk, boys. At the start of the scene, Nemec pours Andor a drink. At the end, this happens. Busy day, Clem. Finish your milk. Andor isn't ready to listen to Nemec, so he doesn't drink the milk that Nemec gave him. Nice touches abound in this series. Here's another. Andor uses a different name in each arc, and in this one, he goes by his adopted father's name, Clem, who we learn was executed by the Empire. We see a flashback of this later where Clem was trying to stop people from protesting the Empire, but because of some bad timing, they assume that he was the one that was rebelling, and that's why he dies. So Andor going by the name Clem here tells us that he is learning the lesson of his father, which is, bluntly, don't rebel. Contrasted with Nemec is that other guy in the scene, whose name is Skeen, which makes this a Skeen scene. Skeen is extremely skeptical of everyone else's motivations, because his biggest worry is that everyone is as selfish and immoral as he is. Nemec is an optimist, an idealist, who sees the best in everyone. Andor shows up out of nowhere, and Nemec is the only person who for no apparent reason completely trusts that Andor is a rebel at heart. He's committed. I'm feeling that. I want to. Feel what? His belief in the cause. When it comes down to it, that's all I need to know. That's his blind spot. This is a character that's introduced to us sleeping on the job. He's got a great handle on the politics of the rebellion, but not on the people. He's too trusting. Then there's Skeen, who suspects the worst of everyone. All the sleep on watch, they're gonna put your head on a pike for a laugh. Sorry. At the end of the arc, Skeen makes a pitch to Andor. They've just gotten away with the money they were stealing, and they have this chance to betray the two surviving rebels, take the ship, split the winnings. Skeen feels that he can convince Andor of this because they have the same suspicions about other people because they both grew up impoverished. You're not here to save anybody but yourself. I saw the first minute you came into camp, you're just like me. We were born in the hole and all we know is climbing over somebody else to get out. Andor shoots him immediately, which isn't just him killing a bad guy, but rejecting that part of his own personality, his fear that everyone will betray him. Because the stuff that Skeen was saying is the same stuff that we'd expect from Andor earlier in the show. But at the same time that this happens, Nemec dies from wounds he took on the mission and wills his manifesto to Andor. So Andor becomes less motivated by selfishness, but in that same moment, he also loses the direct revolutionary figure in Nemec who is pushing him towards genuine radicalization. He has the tools to get there himself in the form of the manifesto, but not the will. Which brings us to the third arc. Fascism is a prison. Oh, look at that, a new shot. The next batch of episodes are the best of the bunch. Best of the year, can't say enough good about them. Because in addition to having one of the most interesting locations and compelling supporting characters in any piece of Star Wars media ever, this is where the questions of how does someone become a rebel and what does it cost come to full fruition. At the start of the arc, I think audiences are probably a little surprised by where we find Andor. I definitely thought that the next episode would open with him reading Nemec's book and it'd be like, okay, he has a revolutionary mindset now. Instead, we see Andor going in the complete opposite direction. After the nearly botched Aldani heist where almost everyone on the team died, he pretty reasonably wants nothing to do with the war. A lot of movies and TV shows try to pull off a beat in the story known as the refusal of the call, because that's what Joseph Campbell told them to do. But it can often feel like just ticking a box off of a list. Like we need the character to say no to the adventure for 0.5 seconds because that will make them more relatable. But these stories aren't really interested in the psychology of reluctance. But in a story where the main arc is about radicalization, about a man gaining political consciousness, it's reluctance and apathy and fear that are the central obstacles. Andor is given so many chances to be part of the rebellion, but keeps refusing them. So the story has to keep hammering at his reasons for saying no. Because reluctance is the impulse to just 
go along to get along, to not stick your neck out, to play it safe. Because we don't want to lose anything. We don't want to risk anything. Andor doesn't. It's fear. He's finally got the resources he needs to liberate himself from the cycles of poverty that he was stuck in and to escape the eye of the Empire, and he wants to bring the handful of people he loves with him and live out a quiet and peaceful life, just like he said at the beginning of the second arc. It's better to leave. Better to eat, sleep, do what you want. The point of these episodes is to say, no, you can't do that. You can't just free yourself from your own chains. You've got to free everybody from their chains as well. Because so long as one person is oppressed, we are all oppressed. The fight doesn't stop until the system of oppression is torn down and replaced. Really channeling my inner Nemec today. Throughout the show, Andor's most consistent observation about the Empire is that their comfort is what makes them weak. He says some form of it in every arc. They're so fat and satisfied, they can't imagine it. Can't imagine what? That someone like me would ever get inside their house. Well, you're half right. The Empire doesn't play by the rules. And how am I wrong? <sighs> they don't care enough to learn. You think they're listening? You think they care enough to make an effort? Like you would know. I know this. They don't need to care. All they need to do is turn this floor on twice a day and keep their numbers rolling. His observations are apt, but there's also an element of projection to them, because if Andrew was a member of the Empire, that's how he would act. If he was comfortable, he wouldn't worry about the details. Comfort is what he wants, but the Empire won't let him have it. So Andor is trying to enjoy his life when, for basically no reason at all, he gets abducted by the state and thrown into a prison where he is forced to do manual labor for the Empire. Suddenly the tables are turned in this series because up until this point it has been other characters who have been trying to radicalize Andor so that he will help them pull off the rebellion. Luthen has tried to give him the tools and the guerrilla strategies that he needs to physically fight the Empire. Nemec has tried to instill in him a political consciousness so that he can intellectually parse the oppressive tactics of the Empire. But up until this point, both have failed. But nothing will radicalize someone faster than when they are put into a position where they need to convince someone else to join them. In the Imperial prison, Andor is put under the control of Kino, another prisoner who is in charge of one of the rooms where the prisoners are making something or other. In the first episode here, Kino feels like a character we've met a million times before. The hard-ass prison slash military guy who yells orders at the hero and we assume that he's going to be the main obstacle for Andor to overcome in order to escape the prison. But when I say obstacle, I mean you think Kino is going to be the guy they're going to have to distract or sneak around while they pull off the plan? Instead, Kino is the obstacle in the sense that Andor has to convince him to join the escape attempt. He has to convince Kino to rebel. There's a whole episode where Andor is just relentlessly trying to turn Kino's mind toward resistance, but Kino won't have it. You want out of here alive, turn that part of your mind off. Kino just wants to keep his head down, serve out the remainder of his sentence, and leave. But then he finds out that there is no escaping from the prison. That once his sentence is up, they're just going to transfer him to a different prison and keep shuffling him around until he's dead. He is confronted with the knowledge that he is going to die in this prison, and that's what convinces him to step up. How many guards on each level? Never more than 12. This setting is so potent. It's constructed as a metaphor for all life under a totalitarian regime. Because the defining quality of that kind of regime is that everywhere becomes a prison. Your body is under constant surveillance and control, your labor is coerced, you are physically punished for disobedience, and there's no escape because wherever you go is just another part of the prison, a labyrinth of oppression designed to keep you in chains. And so knowing that, the only option becomes to resist, even if it means you won't survive the effort. Because like Kino says, there is only one way out. Kino knows he probably won't survive. But I'm gonna assume I'm already dead. I think he's aware that the prison is surrounded by water and that even if he manages to coordinate a prison break, he might be able to free everyone else, but he will probably drown or be recaptured and executed. He does all of this with that in the back of his mind because he's doing in real time what Luthen is describing in another part of this episode, that he has been forced to sacrifice everything to fight the Empire, even though he knows he won't be able to enjoy the post-Empire period. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise that I know I'll never see. 
Everyone is Moses in this episode, leading others to a promised land they cannot enjoy themselves. That's what rebelling costs and why we're also afraid to be the one that stands up. It's why the story has to be about Andor becoming a rebel even though he explicitly and repeatedly shows that he does not want to be part of it. Because the people doing this work aren't going to see the fruits of this labor. They have to do it for the singular reason that it is immoral to do nothing. He knows everything he needs to know and feels everything he needs to feel. And when the day comes that those two pull together, he will be an unstoppable force for good. This show takes the process of radicalization seriously, and every part of it is a nuanced argument for the necessity of revolution when faced with authoritarianism and or totalitarianism and or fascism. And that's just Andor's arc on the show. There are also plot lines exploring the factional infighting that revolutions must overcome to build a cohesive movement, how those within the political elite are needed to coordinate resistance efforts, the intricacies of a fascist bureaucracy, and a pair of queer characters who have an actual real relationship instead of something that can be excised for China in less time it takes me to write my YouTube titles. Rarely have I seen a piece of pop culture that is such a thorough critique of so many different interlocking systems of control in such an efficient and measured way. I never expected the Star Wars franchise to be capable of doing something like this again. Andor is a show that I had zero excitement for going into its premiere, but it has surprised me at every turn. It's not just good for its franchise or its genre, but some of the best TV this year. Now, maybe you're watching this while you're on vacation, and for some reason Andor or some other show that you want to watch isn't available in that region. You paid for a streaming subscription, but now you can't watch the stuff that you paid for? I'd hate that as much as Cyril Karn hates blue milk. But unlike Cyril Karn, who is stuck drinking that nasty bowl of garbage, you can still watch all of your favorite shows wherever you are in the world by using NordVPN, the sponsor of this video. Setting up NordVPN is literally the easiest thing to do. You just download the app, and a couple of clicks later, the internet will think you're in America, or wherever you choose. There's also a ton of other cybersecurity protections that NordVPN offers, like notices about phishing attempts which are attempts to steal your passwords and identity that Nord can warn you about. Nord is a great way to make sure that your data is safe when you use the internet. You can try it with no risk as well, as Nord has a 30-day money-back guarantee. So go to nordvpn.com slash just right to get the two-year plan, and you'll get four additional months for free. That's nordvpn.com slash just right. Thanks for watching, everybody. And a big thank you to my patrons for supporting me on Patreon, including Mike Moss and Dog Best Dog. If you want to support the show and get your name in the credits, just go to patreon.com slash just right. Also, I just want to acknowledge uh, everyone who came in after the iRobot video. We doubled the Patreon, so thank you for that. Keep writing, everyone. It's not just fun and or political. It's not one or the other. It's both and. You know, like the other guys that helped destroy a Death Star. The both ands. Many Bothans died to bring us this information.